bearded bow man. Welcome back, all my bearded guys and gals that listen to the show. Appreciate you being here with us today. So I have someone that um, was kind enough to let me come onto their podcast. And of course, you know, I'm sure he's more than willing to talk about it so we can get you over there listening to what they're putting out. But today I am joined by Janesh Patel. Uh, I appreciate you being here, sir. Um, it's I had a lot of fun during our conversation on your podcast and I would love for you to just, you know, let the listeners, the watchers get an idea of what Uptime Health does, the podcast, and just kind of like the journey where you're at today. I appreciate it, Chase. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, just some context about Uptime Health. Our company is trying to automate or turnkey how outpatient ambulatory facilities manage their medical equipment. Uh, we know they do a poor job of it today, so we want to provide them with the software to really help them understand what to do with their devices, who to call when it breaks down, and really just create a simpler process for them. Um, it's part of the company and some of the promotion we do, we have a podcast called No Filter Healthcare, and we just bring on interesting people in the industry to talk about their perspectives, what they see. Loved having you on too, you know, as a biomed engineer myself, um, getting to talk to somebody else, you know, that's lived and breathed some of the things that I did back before I built the company. That was always fun. So I appreciate you coming on. It was a good convo. Yeah. We kind of got into a lot of, in a short amount of time. So to start off, you're, you, you came out guns blazing. So <clears throat> I would love to hear how medical devices aren't being taken, you know, managed properly as you alluded to. Uh, would you mind going in a little bit more depth with that? Yeah. And I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus because I really believe people would do if they knew what to do for these devices in these settings. But one of the things I learned early going to urgent cares and even surgical centers and dental practices, optometry practices, all these places with medical equipment that provides patient care, a lot of them, especially in these smaller arenas, they're just run and operated by doctors, nurses, assistants, staff members. You don't really see a biomed in that department structure. One, it might not make sense for them to even have one, right? They, they might only have a hundred yeah. pieces. So why have a full-time person? So they rely on these outpatient or not, they rely on these like outsourced vendors to do this work. And you know, even then they don't really understand what's required of the machines when a uh, technician's out on site asking them, hey, have you done this to this machine yet? Or what kind of maintenance plan is actually on this device? And they don't have great answers. Um, so I want them to be able to feel confident in how they manage the equipment. But every client that's come to us today hasn't really had much starting out. And I actually applaud them for trying to get better at it. The whole reason they're using us is because they understand they need to be better. So I applaud them for moving in the direction, uh, but it's definitely kind of scary to see what, what's out there. Yeah. You know, it's funny uh, with our company, we just recently, we got reached out to by a hospital just out in the middle of nowhere. This is a very rural-esque LTAC. And from what we gather is they don't have an actual inventory of what equipment they have. The inventory they sent us does not match what they say they do or don't do. And that tells me two things. One is what is the biomed doing? Because they have a full-time biomed and we'll get into that in a second. The second thing is they, <laughs> if you don't know what you have, how are you servicing it? How are you doing the preventive maintenance? How are you ensuring calibrations, batteries, reporting? All of that are where they need to be. Yeah. And part of this goes into what I just alluded to is the biomed they have. I don't think he's an actual biomed. I think he's probably... A mechanic or maybe an electrician or something like that, that they're using to, you know, band-aid things together when they need it to. Yeah. The second thing is when you're getting into medical device compliance, um, 
for instance, Texas, I would say we're probably one of the more heavier regulated um, states when it comes to like joint commission, DMV, state surveys, et cetera. Uh, this particular hospital is in Oklahoma. And as far as I'm aware, it's just state survey. You don't have to deal with all the compliance stuff because most hospitals out there, they don't go after the accreditation, which that's a whole nother thing entirely. Um, for the listener or watcher may or may not know, you know, the accreditation comes with funding through Medicaid, Medicare services that really give another leg up and an edge to a hospital to facilitate better rounds and better levels of care for a patient. And that hasn't really been the case from what I've came across in Oklahoma because uh, I'm, I was actually born there. Uh, I have family there. I'm very familiar with the medical infrastructure of Oklahoma. So I'm not just speaking out of my ass, but <clears throat> it's a little bit of the wild west when it comes to medical device regulation and tying this back to what you were talking about is, you know, we can put all of this on top of the facility itself, not having the knowledge of how to manage medical devices. But this also goes to, for instance, the ISO companies like the one I'm a part of. This is where you step in and, you know, share your knowledge and obviously do the due diligence to do good by these facilities. A lot of these people, they don't even know what a biomed is or what our uh, responsibilities, what are, you know, at the end of the day, the biomed is used for taking care of medical equipment helping with accreditation and, you know, fixing stuff. <laughs> uh, most of the time people just look at this, okay, who do we call to fix this? Yeah. But the the accreditation and the, the reporting is where people get into trouble a lot. And I'm assuming that's a big thing that you've run into a lot too, is they don't know, you know, what are the inspection levels, like what equipment has to be checked you know, during the sink intervals, is it an annual inspection? Is it semi? What, you know, how in depth is it? What's required? Because, you know, the servicing on like, let's say an anesthesia unit is going to far surpass like a, a blood pressure monitor. Yeah. But I'm just curious, you know, what, what kind of, do you have any particular things that you can, you know, recollect of what you've came across out there in the wilderness? No, it's, I mean, I'll echo the same. It's you go into most of our clients, they honestly don't have even an accurate inventory roster. And like you mentioned, how do you manage what you don't know you even own? Because you can't have an accurate program at that level. But the biggest thing is some of some of them, you know, they they believe they're doing the right thing. And when you try and tell them, you know, otherwise, it's a little bit of a friction moment. Because one, you've just told them you haven't been doing it right for years before me. And it's like this moment of realization that, oh my, my goodness, like I might have actually affected patient care poorly and they don't want to admit that, you know, they want to kind of stand their ground saying, you know, we don't, we don't have to do an annual this. We don't have to do semi. Yeah. Who, who are you to tell me I'm doing it wrong? Right. I, I know <laughs> this practice. I know healthcare. Who are you? You know, kind of situation. That's exactly right. So I run into everything you just mentioned. And at the end of the day, the best thing we can tell them is we are here to help you. We're not here to punish you. We're here to help you like level up and get you to that next sense of I'm here. Like you mentioned, people have accreditation. People have other regulatory bodies ensuring their quality of care and their standard of care is high. And those are the people that really take pride in it if they're trying to go for it. But at the same time, those who don't, those are the people that we kind of run, run up against and, Try and let them know you're just not doing things correctly. We would love for you to reduce the breakdown so you can increase the patient volumes and increase service, everything. Everybody wins at that level. But, you know, the number one hurdle that we come across time and time again are two things. One, the stubbornness of the person that has been managing this, whether, you know, through ignorance or just, you know, blind, not paying attention to it. And they just, like you said, they can't accept that, you have a different perspective or maybe a completely different take on how they're managing their medical devices. Yeah. And sometimes people will take offense to that, or maybe it scares them or, you know, maybe a combination of both. But at the end of the day, that leads down to cost. Yep. And, you know, for that hospital that I brought up a minute ago, the 
cost of what they're using to do what they're doing now is pennies on the dollar compared to what it actually takes to maintain that level of service reporting full full time technician uh the the repairs the all of it yeah and i i believe when you start throwing quotes out there for what it's actually going to take to get them in you know respectable regulatory compliance that's when stuff gets tricky and you know you have a company that has been doing this deals with the regulars knows exactly what the expectations are and as opposed to wanting to spend the money to get there they'll go run after you know a mom and pop uh, iso service and that's we keep running into this time and time again but you know a lot of hospitals we had closures uh, a lot of the critical access hospitals, LTACs, the, you know, because they're spread all throughout Texas, speaking specifically, uh, COVID really hurt people, um, medical facilities in, in general in these rural areas that I'm just talking about specifically. And those closures were a direct hindrance of they did not have the ability to bring in patients. They did not have the funding from because they're not accredited or maybe they lost their accreditation. There's a whole plethora of stuff. Uh <laughs> It's kind of like a, it's it's been an interesting couple of years, especially when you just take all those factors and just kind of compile them and look back and like, wow, this is, this has kind of changed the landscape a little bit. Yeah, I think when I, you hit it, you hit it on the head a little bit with the things we run into get run into when we talk to new people. It's this cost. Why we never paid this much before? We never even had a process. So why are we paying for it now? And getting over that hurdle. So the biggest way that we combat that um, is we, we go to their CFOs and we go to their operators and we ask them the simple questions that to me and you and most other people probably make sense, but maybe they never did this, you know, drawing the line directly to, to revenue. So, you know, we say you have an equipment, it fails because maybe it wasn't maintained or managed properly. You put a lot of effort and energy behind it. Well, because that product has now failed in your patient care environment, you are re-triaging a patient somewhere else or moving them. That is cost, time, and energy. You are now maybe taking down a whole room for a period of time, which would be building services on top of during that moment in time as well. But it is now unable to collect revenue for you. You now have nurses on staff who might have been managing that room or multiple rooms, and you might not need that overhead, but you're paying for it. So there's a lot of these things and these uh, like costs that they're not creating in their head because they just see it as a direct cost. They're not seeing the missed revenue, the operational disruption. When we think about physician and provider burnout, we're adding wrenches, we're throwing obstacles and dodgeballs at them now while they're still doing patient care. Yeah. And when they start thinking about it in that macro level, the ROI is simple. It is there. It is, it is undeniably there, but they just see the pennies on the dollar. Like you mentioned and saying, well, now I'm paying, you know, 50 cents to the dollar and I was paying pennies on the dollar. How do I make this make sense? So that's how we've talked to them. And to be honest, and again, to their credit, once you help them connect the dots, it's no longer, what are you talking about? How's that much? It's more like, Hmm, that's interesting. I have to think about that. It's it's at least a moment of consideration versus just absolute no. So, I, but you're absolutely right. That is one of the biggest things. Uh, I, I like that you you come at them from a ROI perspective because you know one of the things we talk about within the biomed industry is a lot is you know we went from simply fixing and maintaining stuff to having to get into talk about distributing budgets and consolidating expenses and, you know, handling life cycle management devices to where it makes sense to, you know, move from a contractual obligation to time and materials because of how much it's going to save the facility. And then that's where the biomed really comes into play uh, when it comes to one, justifying our services, but also, you know, bringing value to all the medical facilities, because at the end of the day, they have to manage within the constraints that we have. And Unfortunately, with the landscape of medical in general, you know, those those constraints have kind of been a little bit constricted. Um, you know, the, the landscape of medical, you know, medical care in general is this kind of like 
it's it's shifted from when I think about like you know insurance plans and everything from like when I was a kid to what it is now, and it's kind of like you know everybody's just trying to see what the others does right now we're in this space where a lot of facilities I see are getting bought up by like corporations, for instance, and then they get repackaged, retooled, put back out. Um, they get their, their ROI <laughs> and then it gets recycled again from the next buyer and so forth. It's kind of been that way for the past at least five years from what we see, especially within our area, um, which makes it very hard <laughs> when it comes to managing medical devices, because for instance, like when you think of like ERs, for instance, this one has been prevalent in Texas. Yeah. You'll have one system, they'll they'll sell, another one picks it up. Those devices end up getting acclimated and pulled into whatever, because obviously they bought the devices with also the account and just gets recycled and recycled and recycled. And that's kind of the, the landscape we're in right now, which isn't necessarily beneficial to patients or the end user. It just makes stuff logistically a little bit more conflated and confusing. Uh, there's so much confusion out there. I think the, 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 <laughs> other, the other thing, you know, um, especially going back to the trying to convince people how to do this better, make it make sense for them. I think the other thing that they don't understand, and again, as a provider, they are seeing things from patient care is me, my nurses, my staff, and my patient in front of me. A lot of times they take for granted the equipment that is working around them at all times. I think we talked a little bit about this on our podcast, which is care should be defined as patient plus provider plus medical device. There's hardly any care today that gets provided just by a doctor nurse looking at somebody. You know, or they're going to do this and check their yeah. blood pressure. It's, you know, you at least have some kind of cuff, some kind of monitor, some kind of temperature gauge, some kind of utility item that is helping you create diagnostics. And the fact that they take it for granted is, a, is sad a little bit because it's, and we do it all the time in day-to-day -day world, right? We have cars. Every time I go into my car, I expect me to turn on the engine in that car or start running. Like I take that for granted sometimes, but I do know I have to change its oil. I have to put gas in it. I have to make sure, you know, it is still able to run the next day. So when I do turn that ignition, you know, at least 99 times out of a hundred, it's going to crank and turn on. So I, I, I sometimes get upset with, you know, the, the providers who don't kind of factor in the equipment into like in taking it for granted that it's always working, always up and running, but it's the people behind it. And all that management and understanding and the education you provide and bring to it that makes that happen. And also showing like this is this is an important part of my patient care environment. And I think that's that's that holistic part that sometimes gets missed by a lot of people. I, I think, you know, it's not just obviously there's let, let's look at it from this. Like there there is a there's been a culture shift since from when I was a kid, you know, back in the nineties to where it is now. Technology has changed everything with the strides that we have made technologically. I mean, if you just think of like what you brought up and then also cell phones, oh, yeah. a lot of people can't function nowadays without having, cause everything is tied to your phone, your banking, your navigation, your emails, your, you know, simple communication with family members, social media, uh, looking up any kind of knowledge through, through Google and uh, Wikipedia, whatever. That same thing translates to medical devices. There is almost, you know, an idea or kind of like a back of the mindset that, you know, it's there, it's a tool for us. And when you have something so easily accessible and usable to make your life easier, you lose appreciation of it. So uh, at least until it goes down, then you realize like how important it is. And this goes into, you know, the general aspect of people not knowing what a biomed is. You don't realize like how important behind the scenes, some of these, some of my colleagues out across the United States and in the world are having an impact on everyday people's lives. Everything that gets hooked up to test vitals, to help uh, treat injuries or maybe diseases, 
every one of those devices are managed, repaired, calibrated, and overall serviced by the biomed. And this goes back to where we started the conversation. You know, are you ensuring that all of those things are being provided for that medical device and all of your devices within your facility? Because if you're not, you're not doing a service to your patients at the end of the day. And that's that's what all of our services, biomed, nurses, physicians, anesthesiologists, radiologists, at the end of the day, that's our mission. That is our mantra to elevate patient care, optimize it, and ensure patient safety. If we're not doing that to the best of our ability, then somebody's either not caring or is ignorant of the fact. Yeah, I agree with you. I, never, I personally have never met a biomed that doesn't understand that. Uh, you know, they're not doing the job for the glory. They're doing it because they know it's a valued service and they want, you know, if they were ever in the hospital, their family members are in the hospital, every product that's on them, device, whatever it might be, is to the top quality and the best of their ability because they want the same treatment when they, when they might be in there. Yeah, we're, we're kind of uh, civil servants in that fact. Um, yeah. Yeah. One, uh, one of the organizations that handles all of our accreditation and everything, Amy, you know, they do a survey every year. Over 70% of the people within our field would recommend our field because of how rewarding and how much at the end of the day they go home feeling like they made a difference. Yeah. And that translates to, you know, you find a lot of biomeds that are happy with where we are because, you know, we get a sense of we're doing something and we're proud of it and we take pride in what we do and, you know, we're going into the job day in, day out, really coming home and feeling like, I love what I do. I'm ready to do it again tomorrow. I I would think that I kind of present that considering I did an entire podcast <laughs> <laughs> tailored to my field. But yeah, I, it's a, I, I, I would agree. I think majority of my colleagues love what we do and we take it very seriously. And sometimes it's frustrating as well coming from a biomed's perspective, speaking with somebody that's not managing their devices the way they should be. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're passionate about getting it right. And sometimes it comes off like people may not care. And that kind of, that can rub me wrong sometimes, some days. Yeah, because you care so much. And it's like, how can somebody not care? And it's, it's like you feel like from mm-hmm. different sides of the spectrum that everyone should be in pretty good alignment uh, of what you guys do and what it means. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the, the medical industry is a trillion dollar, you know, industry. And then the medical device industry is quickly going up to the overall span of what the medical industry is yeah. costing. It's, it's growing every single year. And you know, rightly so. There's advancements and treatments and technology and just ways we're doing those treatments. And then, you know, the optimization, which is what happens when technology grows. But there's almost a stigma to where we have kind of like a back of the mind mentality that medical device servicing and just patient care in general is tied to the dollar. And I wish we could move away from that a little bit. I obviously money is necessary, but it shouldn't be the driving force in patient care. That's what we need to get away from. And I think the U S medical infrastructure is tied directly to, you know, cost versus benefit. Whereas you go to other countries that have universal medical care and everything. And, you know, it's not tied to the dollar. It's tied to just providing care. You know, you go to another country as an American, and you're, you know, I see videos all the time. Like I didn't have to pay yeah, anything you just walk in. because it's, it's not tied to that. I'm not, I'm not trying to get political or anything with this. It's just, it's, it's, it's a mindset and it's, it's something that cost is driving everything we do in medical care. Period. Yeah. It's the incentivization. So that's just kind of the way we, way it is. I think nowadays. it's like the incentivization model, right? It's like, it's a tried and true thing and something we talked about in all, all business books. Like you measure yourself on KPIs, you drive a entire business that direction and you achieve those metrics. Yes. For the healthcare system here. I mean, again, not trying to be political, but just saying it like in generalities is if you're incentivized to make money, 
which is what a for-profit hospital does. And most hospitals are for profit. Mm -hmm. You're incentivized to make money and you are not incentivized to expand on cost. You're not incentivized to buy the Ferraris of everything. You're incentivized to figure out where the margins are and squeeze those down as humanly possible while not evading any kind of, you know, fiduciary care to your shareholders, but also not, not giving the service that you expect patients expect. So you're, you're trying to balance a fine line, but you're not trying to go above and beyond the fine line. Mm -hmm. And to me and you and to everyone who wants patient care, we want people to be operating way above that fine line. I'm not trying to get the standard minimum. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get the best possible result in care. And unless I'm going to pay tons of dollars to go to that, you know, really expensive place out there, it's, it's all about people with incentivization models that are driving them to make certain decisions. And, that, and that's all it is at the end of the day. Yeah. So while I was on your podcast, which, you know, before I get into my next topic, I, I would love to give you a chance just to plug the podcast, you know, for people that may not be aware of it, because I, I, I love, you know, the mantra that you guys have. It's, it's no filter. It's come on, speak your piece, you know, share, share with us some information, foresight, and just kind of give your take that other people might not know about. So I would just love to hear just how the podcast started you know, and just what your mission, what your vision is for. Yeah, honestly, um, it, it was started just to give a voice to those who might not have voices or you have your podcast, which I respect because I love what you do and what you promote. Uh, but there's not a lot of those people in those avenues out there, right? At the end of the day, what I wanted to do is create a more generalized version of just no filter healthcare for those who might not be providers themselves, but offer services into the healthcare ecosystem. Just come on here and talk about who you are, what you do, just want to get you out there. But two, talk to me about something that you wish you were able to say out loud, and that might frustrate you. Maybe it's not frustrating, but you just want to just say it and make sure people understand it. And for you and your message, obviously, um, the no filter healthcare was beautiful. <laughs> and so that's, you, you really kind of absorb that hashtag that we have. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's other people out there that are like, okay, I tried to start a business in this industry in healthcare and people are really resistant to change and it sucks because healthcare needs to change. And it's like, you know, saying that out loud, letting people absorb that and letting other people and other vendors and other service providers in these industries sometimes feel like you're not alone. They feel the same way. They're running into the same obstacles. We're all screaming at yeah. the same wall. So at least you are side by side with someone screaming at the wall. It's not just you alone anymore. That that's kind of the way. Yeah, it's 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 us coming together with a shared, you know, initiative because anybody that truly cares about elevating right. patient care is gonna have some sort of problem from their particular avenue with the current exactly. system. And everyone Point comes out of it. And the people say that there's nothing wrong with the healthcare system in general whatsoever. They're either not a part of it, they're not in it day to day, um, or they just haven't been paying attention to, you know, labor shortages, nurses walking out, my field having labor shortages, training shortages, uh, training opportunities. And then what I want to get into next is right to repair, which affects everybody because it's not just. Yeah, I can speak to the medical device, but it deals with cars, deals with cell phones, computers, everything. And this has kind of been an ongoing challenge for probably over a decade at least, you know, getting the Senate to recognize that. Let's look at it. If you are a consumer, you should have the right, the ability to have the resources made available to you to service, repair, whatever you need to do, what you own, what you purchase. Yeah. I mean, that that's basically the standard thing. So let's look at it from our standpoint, from a hospital standpoint. A uh, hospital buys any particular device and they own it. It's a part, it's on their books. They have to claim it. They have to service it. They have to assure that it's regulated and taken care of. So if a hospital has to abide by all of those principles, then they should also have some freedoms or, you know, abilities to 
work that in their favor as well. I mean, if it's if it's really truly theirs and where the biomed perspective comes in that, you know, this has been an ongoing mission of mine and many other of my colleagues is we are very hindered when it comes to supporting medical devices just by not having service literature available, not being able to utilize tech support of the OEM, which we will reach out to if we're over our heads or maybe have a question, uh, not having accessibility to parts, and then not having accessibility to training to work on that equipment. And I read articles from multiple news outlets and pundits and legislators, and they have the same, I, I think we call it FUD, is, you know, disinformation almost, or maybe coming at it from a perspective that might not be 100% true. Uh, if a biomed that is not uh, completely affiliated with the OEM has access to service, repair, maintain their equipment, it's going to put patients at risk and will cause deaths. And I read that and it offends me on a level. And I've talked to so many of my colleagues that will, will, will read that or will have that discussion thrown in her face. And at the end of the day, the biomed wants to do stuff by the book. We want to ensure that we're able to facilitate the same level of care for these medical devices that OEM say we do not. So there's a, there's a separation of, you know, two different talking points and what the biomed is trying to do, which we, we recently had, Justin from the Better Biomed channel and Dustin Zimmerman from the Avante Arts program go speak to Congress in the beginning of July to voice our concerns. And at the end of the day, our goal is to have one seat at the table while the OEM has another seat at the table. And hey, let's let's navigate what our issues with, you know, are more so concerns with supporting each other can be. And let's find a solution, whereas, you know, throwing more and more FUD into the bucket and just pushing it down the line to eventually what I think is going to happen is the FDA is going to ultimately end up with the decision to figure out how we're going to regulate this. Um, I would fairly long winded. <laughs> and I apologize for that. But you brought up a report during our conversation on your yeah. podcast and I just want to go through the main points of that report and just give people the information so that they can make an informed decision yeah, for I themselves. Mean, that report is huge because I know it's a lot of, like you said, you feel offended as a biomed for some of the things that are said by the OEMs, but me and you both know that same OEM is going to call you to do the repair anyways when they can't make it out there. So it's a so, little bit of, they say one thing, but they do the other. And it's really because they're protecting their, business they they don't want to, yeah, they're, they're shareholders. shareholders in their business. It's not about the patient. And, and at the end of the day, you know, they complained to Congress. They, they themselves complained to the FDA saying, look at all these biomeds. They're not certified. They're not beholden to the same regulations that we're beholden to. And like you even mentioned, there are ISOs out there that have 9,001 certification. They they're doing what they're supposed to be doing to make sure that every 9,001, 13,485, we're going after and getting them because we want to go by yeah, the book you and say follow we, the rules. They're, but they're, they're not do, saying that. And, and that's the thing is like, you, no one's giving you the pathway to say, what do we need to prove to you to, to say that we're just as good? So, you know, back in 2018, when the FDA actually submitted this report to publication, um, you know, was initially supposed to be a review of all the patient safety events that happened with medical devices and maybe the contribution causes. And they wanted to paint a picture that independence were a bigger cause to patient safety, you know, because they're not repairing things right. That's why machines are failing more. Um, all there's quality issues. They don't know what they're doing. That was a picture they were trying to paint. And the reason they pushed this report, the findings of the report were the exact opposite. <laughs> the findings of the report actually said, there is no discrepancy that is noticeable between an independent biomed and a OEM biomed. And not only that, it took it one step further to even say in the report and their findings that independent biomeds are absolutely necessary for this 
ecosystem to even exist. They need to be there. We need that extra support because there's not enough biomeds out there. So if we're trying to shut down half the market, we can't do that. So the FDA actually not only talked about how the independents of the world are doing a good job or just as good of a job as the OEMs and that they're absolutely necessary to exist and survive and we need to prop them up. That to me is like the totem pole I would go down to Congress with and say, look, if you're going to let the FDA make this decision, let them make it. It looks like they already have their minds made up though. We're not harming patient care. We are absolutely benefiting the ecosystem at large. And that's what I think everyone knows, everyone believes, even the OEM technicians believe and know. They're just not allowed to say it because that's not what their company is allowing them to say. Well, I, I've spoken from several people within different OEMs because the OEM Biomed is just as much of our community, if not a more vital component yes. of our community, because us that aren't affiliated with OEM, you know, we're, we're left out of constraints sometimes just because we don't have that support. And it's through our fellow brothers and sister biomeds out in the OEM community that are supplying us with those tools and that literature behind the scenes to ensure we can take care of our little LTAC or CAH hospital out in the middle of nowhere that the OEM will not go out to or tap on the shoulder yeah. of an ISO to get to. So I am the first to, you know, thank the OEM Biome because you guys are vital. You guys are what are keeping us afloat out here. Oh, wait, and can I say one um, thing? Uh, this is what you said is absolutely yes. perfect. And right. When I say OEM, I'm talking company corporate body, not the biomed themselves who is yes. doing the work who knows what you, like I said, they know the value that you and all the other independents in themselves bring. They're the ones actually fighting the good fight within the big organization. They just don't have the power that me and you wish they had to talk about corporate rules and, you know, not letting you have access to parts and all that other stuff. So you're, yeah. I want to just clarify what And what, what, what's so funny, too, is we're not trying to take away from their business. We're just trying to add options to the end user that is directly responsible for patient care. The worst feeling in the world as a biomed, which unfortunately I've had to make this statement many times to customers over the past couple of years, is I am so sorry. I do not have access to parts. I do not have access to literature. Tech support literally laughed at me on the phone when I asked for anything that has happened. And you will have no other choice than to spend whatever price they throw at you, whatever OEM this may be, to get support or get your unit fixed. It's my hands are tied, and that's the end of it. That is the worst feeling you can give to anybody, especially when we start talking about budgeting, constraints, and everything else. And, you know, some of these hospitals, LTACs especially, that are struggling um, let's be frank, the, the OEM model there, they don't make their money really outside of after the contract. So their money isn't going to be beneficial per the PM. It's going to be the repair costs, the, the service after the contract, and then whatever money they got for you purchasing the, the device. So why would they give up their bottom line? to supply these resources to us because that's going to hurt share uh, shareholder interest. Um, I, I understand there's, there's other parts of this and that's fine. Like I said, it, it doesn't bother me because everybody has a business. Everybody needs to be able to support their families and everything else that goes along with that. That's fine. All we're asking is a seat at the table and whatever means of negotiation and understanding that comes with that, what have you, so be it. But we're, we're kind of in this, this middle frame. Like we, we, we were talking offline a minute ago, uh, you know, New York passed the first right to repair bill for electronics, but medical devices aren't included in that. And it's, it's, it's a notch towards the right step, but it's a notch. It's like, here's medical devices and yeah. here's my TV's more important than my vital <laughs> essentially is the, 
uh, the right to repair my TV is more important. Hey, some of these yeah. TVs are expensive nowadays. <laughs> no, <I don't> <laughs> For anybody that wants to learn more and read more about this FDA report, put it in the comment section for people to reference that and go explore more to see that we're not just talking out of our ass. And obviously you've talked at length about the number of biomeds and the shortage of the industry and the labor market, and even the aging of the industry itself. And one of the things that I want at least your listeners to also understand is because I don't think the biomed's been put at the forefront of a lot of these conversations in the in the past, and hopefully it's getting more and more out there as you're as some of us have gone to Congress and tried to try to lobby for more ear time. But we already, as a country, are moving legislation, you know, reimbursement policy, and even the patient care model to be closest to this outpatient and ambulatory and eventually in home model of care. And the reason I need to bring this up is we already have a very strained labor force, which is you guys, everyone who's supporting the medical equipment. And right now it's a little easier. I'm not saying it's easy. It's a little easier for a single biomed to go to a large health system and maybe tackle a hundred devices over a period of a couple of days. You know, it's, it's, you have a high density. You can do a lot more in a single place in time then you can if those same, call it 100 devices, existed over 20 locations, which is now urgent care, surgical center. You're starting to see, you know, advanced complex equipment get into these buildings, which is fine because me and you as consumers, we get better care local to us probably for a little cheaper. So at, we win. But we've created a logistical nightmare for the biomed who already his time is, you know, over-indexed. Over and as we go to in-home, that's just now instead of 10 devices per building, it's one device per building. So we've now even created a crazier network. So until we can either increase the labor market to support the sprawl of equipment, increase access to parts to where we can support the sprawl and you know maybe attract new entrants to the, to the actual industry for biomed, or if we can pe have people do some kind of at least self-management at some level, some tiny bits of, hey, here's a self-help video, here's a manual, here's a, a, a access to a quick hot swap part that won't really you know, be considered remanufacturing, but it's just me replacing an air filter in some you know, easy component. We're going to set ourselves up for a night. We're going to be just like your LTAC who couldn't get maybe a normal OEM technician out there. That's the least of the worries when they have to eventually go to people's homes. So I know that this fight that you're creating now, or we're creating now, is going to benefit where we're trying to all go as a society for healthcare. And until we figure out how to increase access to parts, service, increase the labor pool, we're going to be in a moment that we might be sitting at home on our dialysis machine 20 years from now, waiting two weeks for a tech to come out. Well, I need that to, you know, save my life. And that's the, that's the world I don't want. I do not want to be right about that. I want us to get, I want to get it right now, not later on, whenever it becomes a problem. So that's my little soapbox. <laughs> Proactive instead of reactive. And I'll get all my Unfortunately, we're very reactive right now. <laughs> so I appreciate all you guys do. No, I, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, it, medical care is always going to continue to expand. And like I said, with, with going into OEMs, are not going to be able to take care of every urgent care, uh, ER, LTAC, in-home service. Like it's the logistics behind it does not support the numbers yeah, so or the argument. So there's going to have to be some, some understanding exactly. at some help. point. You're not going to be able to conquer the world. I like Thanks. to end the show on a, on a fun note. One segment that I like to call, Oh, the modality. <laughs> There we go. Oh, the modality. All right. So the modality, simply enough, is if you have any kind of uh, recollection of maybe a funny or scarring story that comes to a particular medical device during your, your tenure. Yeah, so I'll your say um, it's more of an embarrassment whenever we were getting trained to look at working on imaging equipment. Um, you know, I worked at TriMedics back in the day, and yes, I was a 
clinical engineering manager, but I also tried to learn some of the service and repair stuff and, uh, you know, getting my hands dirty to do some of that service support. And I remember the first time I saw a phantom uh, for calibration and not knowing what the heck it was, <laughs> you know, it looked like some weird gel device and whatever. And I was just like, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's a big box with gel just, in it. <laughs> what it was, how it worked, and just looking like, this goes on this machine. And like, you know, I basically stood out of the class. It was a very embarrassing moment of just like not knowing how calibration events even worked on imaging equipment. Cause it's not the same as a uh, infusion pump or some of the smaller devices. I'm like, Oh, you just do this. It's some buttons and it's not as hard. And so having like all these objects in front of us completely out of fish out of water. And it was like uh, a very interesting moment. Cause everyone else there at least had some imaging training and like had some kind of level of understanding. I was the only one that was like, <laughs> are, you, are you sure we're in the right spot? <laughs> it, it's kind of some some of the equipment that we use in our field is kind of like it takes you a step back a little bit. Like I don't know how to use this, or yeah. it's, this this doesn't look right. And I was like, how is this possibly <laughs> going to help with this machine? Like, and you know, get it right, and get all the calibration done. And I was just, I was just really confused, and it was a moment that I was completely embarrassed myself. <laughs> yeah. But you got past it. Bi biomeds figure things out inherently one way or another. So I got one more segment for you before I let you go today. To be or not to be. So to be or not to be, simply think of any medical device you can think of, take the functionality of it, and that is your superpower. So what would Janesh's superpower be? See, I kind of help you i'll say that you tried to help me out earlier thinking through this and i'm still so i always tell people mine would be a defibrillator because i can use electrical discharge See, to shoot mine, electricity I, at people. Okay, I, I was trying to get too nerdy with it when i and i was like okay it could be an mri because you're pointing hydrogen molecules in a single direction and you can kind of like help navigate where they go but i was like what is that going to do as a superpower i have no idea how to actually make that something that can I mean, you can get just simplistic with it, or you could get super in depth with it. Yeah, it really just okay, matters so how maybe, your mind goes. Oh, maybe an ultrasound. It'd be cool to use sonar technology to kind of navigate through objects, and you know, eventually, if I can understand and see what's beneath me, I could strike oil or some gold. <laughs> like, well, I, I saw it too. Like you could, you could see, you know, maybe someone's heart speeding up, so you can know if they're reacting on you know, an emotional level, a certain way, maybe they're lying to you or, you know, there's a, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, like I said, you don't have to be overly complicated with it, but I had to have something like this because I think about this stuff during my off time. I'm a nerd and I love, you know, what it is. So, uh, just, I appreciate you being on the podcast today. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Um, look forward to working with you more in the future. And I, I appreciate what you do to give those that don't have a voice an opportunity to speak their, their voice. And that that's ultimately, you know, the mantra for your podcast. And then also what your company provides to customers as well. It's, it's a worthwhile endeavor. So I just wanted to give you your flowers. Appreciate what you do, sir. It's been a pleasure. For anybody that would like to, uh, enlist uptime health services or you know possibly learn more about the podcast uh, where, uh, yeah, you where can would find you us at uptimehealth.com everyone probably listening to the show knows how to spell uptime and the word health so just add this and then uh, podcast I'd hope so. uh, it's just called hashtag no filter healthcare all in one word uh, it's on any you know apple spotify anywhere you can find a podcast all right again thank you for being on yeah, today yeah, I got, and I got all the beard be with you, you. Yeah, so I, I knew I was going to